<laughs> I don't know that I've ever asked a more dumb question in my life. It's appropriate for the place. Uh, my wife got, got her another car about three or four weeks ago. And I believe today is the first time I ever used a sun visor on <laughs> Happy to do that. All right. Uh, Ron had not talked to him since uh, last Sunday when uh, we had class in here. And uh, I think it was last Sunday they went to Florida because uh, his sister-in-law had sister just completed chemotherapy and they wanted to go and visit with him. Um, and I have not talked with him since. I'm assuming and hoping that everything is well. Um, but we're... Uh, he gave me a choice of different topics to use. Uh, he mentioned covering John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, and that would be fine, and uh, a couple of other things. But then he kind of zeroed in on, on this, the, the intellect of Jesus. So, so that's what we're going to focus on today. But let's start with a prayer. Our God and our Father, we are thankful for today. We are thankful for the sunshine for the clean, fresh air. We thank you, Father, for our lives, for the health that we enjoy. We pray that we will use our lives in service to you. We pray, Father, that you will bless us this, uh, this time in this class. Help us to focus on your word. Help us, Father, to block out worldly thoughts and concerns. And, Father, we pray that the things that we do and say this morning will bring glory and honor to your name and will help us to grow, grow stronger and grow closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. When you think of intelligent people in history, who do you think of? Who, who's the first one come to mind? Einstein. Don't tell me you got to draw a blank. Typically, some inventor or something like. Usually, that. think and I'm thinking Einstein. Yeah. I'm thinking uh, Newton. Yeah. Socrates. Um, I, I spent a total of 10 years working in a machine shop, and I used to work for an older gentleman up at uh, around near the Marineville Airport. He was from Estonia. His name, his last name was Luik, L-U-I-K. And this guy was an absolute genius. I mean, he was a genius. He, he had a patent for a firefighting outfit so that firefighters could fight fires, uh, electrical fires, while standing in water. And the basic idea was that well, their feet had to stay in contact with the ground. could not pick up a foot. They had to scoot. But the basic idea was the current would run up one leg across the body and down and out the other leg. And he had a patent for that. This guy was an absolute genius. He had several patents to his name. He had invented another machine, kind of like, the only way I can describe it, kind of like a milling machine, which is a glorified drill press. Mm -hmm. And he had based it on a gyroscope. I don't know how it worked. I cannot explain it. But he would, he was not granted a patent for this machine. Anybody want to guess why? When I tell you, it'll blow your mind. Somebody take a wild guess as to why he was not granted a patent for this machine. Already had too many in his mind. Nope. <laughs> Good guess, though. Nope. When I tell you, it's, going, it's the farthest thing from your mind right now. Somebody else already patented it. Nope. That's a good guess, though. This machine defied one of Newton's laws. I don't know which one. I don't know how it worked. And I don't. I never saw a machine or anything. But it, it defied one of Newton's laws. Therefore, he was not granted a patent for it. I mean, this guy was a genius. Now, on the other hand, and when I say this, I don't mean it derogatory. He was scatterbrained. Absolutely scatterbrained. I went back in the shop one day, and I was his only employee. I was back in the shop, running a uh, running a lathe. I think I was turning down some stainless steel or something. You know. And I love cutting metal. Um, and I heard the awfulest scream. It, ah, just to the top of his lungs. And I thought, what has he done? And I was expecting to find him with the finger cut off or 
he smashed his finger in a filing drawer, or maybe, I don't know what to expect, but he's screaming bloody murder. And I go up there and I ask him, Mr. Love, what's wrong? You know what he said? I lost my pencil and I can't find it. <laughs> I just shook my head and I went back to my machine and picked up where I left off. But the guy was absolutely genius. But when we think of intelligence, you know, we, we tend to think of uh, people like that. Um, <clears throat> what what makes the mind work the way it works, and why does everybody's mind work differently? Why does everybody's mind work differently? What is an early riser to you, Preston? Well, we all varying levels of intelligence for one thing. Okay. And okay. Female versus male, of course, is quite different sometimes. Okay. Um, who gets up first at your house? Me. What time is that? Five. Five? And he gets up at what? Five forty-five. Now, does he ever ask you why do you get up so early? No. <laughs> <laughs> You know, some, some people get up at 5 o'clock. I get up at 5 o'clock every morning. And sometimes my wife will get up at 5, and sometimes it'll be 6, and sometimes it'll be 2, 3, or 4. Um, not because she chooses to do that, but that's just what happens. But for some people, you know, 5 o'clock is early to wake up, and other people, 5 o'clock is late. Why do you sleep so late, Shelby? I mean, if, 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 you, if he worked for, you know, one of the news stations, he was a anchor in the morning at 5 o'clock, He's got to be there. He's going to get up at probably at 3. Um, but why, why do our minds work differently? Uh, some people are geared for this kind of work. Some people are geared for another kind of work. Some people will think this is a bad situation. Some people think, well, that's not so bad. Why do our minds work so so differently? Um, the word intelligence, as described by or defined by Miriam Webster, Miriam Webster says intelligence is the ability to learn or understand or to deal with new or trying situations to reason. And, and that makes sense. It also says the ability to apply knowledge to manipulate one's environment or to think abstractly as measured by objective mater, uh, objective criteria, such as test. And, I, and I'm, in my mind, this is, this is what I've come up with after reading Webster. Uh, in my mind, intelligence, it, it seems that intelligence is the combination of wisdom and knowledge. Bringing those two together. Because what is wisdom without knowledge and what is knowledge without wisdom? You've got to have one accompanied by the other in order to move on. Um, and the more I think about the, the, the broader aspects of wisdom and intelligence and knowledge the more my thinking is honed down to intelligence is basically plain old common sense. I mean, that, that's what it seems like. Just plain old common sense. That, it, that's like uh, seeing the obvious. I mean, it's so obvious. It's right there in front of you. Most people can't see it. best example I can think of with that if you want to turn over there with me, and you probably know where I'm going. First uh, Kings chapter three. The uh, the two women who lived in the same household. One had a baby, and three days later, another had a baby. And uh, the mother of the second baby, one night, she rolled over and laid on her son, and it died. And before morning came, what did she do with that baby? What did she do with the dead baby? She swapped them out. She swapped them out. Well, the mother of the live child woke up the next morning and she's going to nurse her baby. And what did she notice? This ain't mine. This baby is not mine. He is not my son. So they wind up before Solomon. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, um, go to verse 23. And the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is the dead one. And the other said, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, bring me a sword. And so they brought a sword before the king, and the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Stop right there for a minute. We know the story. We know how this turns out. 
But it, pretend right now you don't know the rest of the story. You, you don't know how this is going to turn out. Do you really think a king is going to take a baby and cut him in half? My inclination would say, no, you've got to be up to something. Now, I know we read later about Herod, and he killed, right. you know, a mass infanticide. Um, but I want, I want to give Solomon the benefit of the doubt and trying to pretend I don't know the rest of the story, and, you know, he's, he's up to something. So he's going to cut the baby in half, verse 26. And the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. And the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. Um, what other ways could Solomon have come up with to determine who was the actual mother? I don't know of any. This, what he did appears to be the quickest, the easiest, and the most simple way to figure out whose child his mother is. And, and what did Solomon do? All he did is see the obvious. He saw the obvious. Um, now, Jesus, Jesus went way far beyond just the obvious. Uh, he went... He went a lot farther than, than that. Uh, he went way far outside the box. And in so doing, he reveals to us and to everybody who saw him, he reveals his intellect. He reveals his intelligence. He reveals his wisdom, his knowledge. Um, question. What is the difference uh, between intelligent or between an intelligent and an intellectual. What's the difference between being intelligent and being an intellectual? What is that a fair question? I'd have never thought of it, but I read it. And what what I, from what I understand, an an intellectual is intelligent because when you think about intelligence, intelligence is an umbrella. Uh, under which you'll find the intellectual. So an intelligent or, or an intellectual is uh, an intelligent person. So it's kind of like one and the same, I guess you could say. Um, this article I'm reading, he went on to say that the he, he differentiated in this way. He said the intelligent person reads books, but the intellectual is street smart. No, well, that makes sense. And both of those criteria fit Jesus because we, we know he was educated under the Jewish system. He, he grew up at the feet of a rabbi, just like Paul did. Uh, but he's also street smart. All right. <clears throat> Looking at the intellectual Jesus, here's something for thought right here. And this comes from uh, USC professor of philosophy, Dallas Ward, uh, speaking about the intellect of Jesus. He says, in our culture and among Christians as well, Jesus Christ is automatically disassociated from brilliance or in, in intellectual capacity. He says, not one in a thousand will spontaneously think of him in conjunction with words such as well-informed or brilliant or smart. Often, it seems to me, <clears throat> we see and hear his deeds and words but we don't think of him as one who knew how to do what he did or who really had logical insight into the things he, he said. We don't automatically think of him as a very competent person. He multiplied the loaves and fishes and walked on water, for example, but perhaps he didn't know how to do it. He just used mindless incantations or prayers. Or he taught on how to be a really good person. But he did not have moral insight and understanding. He just mindlessly rattled off words that were piped into him and through him. And then the writer asked a really important question. He says, really? Is this what we think of Jesus? We, when we think of Jesus, we don't automatically think of him as being intelligent or smart. Um, 
in uh, Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That word wisdom comes from the Greek word Sophia, and Ron talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, Sophia means broad and full of intelligence. It's used of knowledge in very diverse matters. But that, that first phrase really got my attention. Broad and full of intelligence. And Jesus grew in that. Um, this this word wisdom, or Sophia, speaks of the wisdom that belongs to men. Um, <clears throat> and it also speaks of supreme intelligence, such as that that belongs to God. All right. And I left out a really important question. And I'm going to ask it now. Not too far ahead of myself. Um, can we imagine Jesus as Lord if He were not smart? Have you ever thought about that? Can we imagine Jesus as Lord if He were not smart? <clears throat> have you ever run up and have you ever run upon somebody where you, you thought their bread just not quite done, and you you don't mean to be mean? Uh, Karen and I have a friend several years ago that visited us, and we were. We left church at Marineville, and, and across the highway there, was, there was a pond. And there's this one Sunday morning we got out in January, or no, it was December. And it was like, I don't know, 33 degrees outside. It was cold. Water wasn't frozen, but it was cold. And there were ducks out there on the water. And he, our friend saw the ducks out on the water, and you know what she said? She said, I bet those ducks are cold. And I thought, that's one of the strangest observations <laughs> I've ever heard of. If, you know, if the ducks were cold, they wouldn't be out there on the water. So they'd probably be somewhere warm. So I'm thinking to myself, that, you know, that's a strange, strange observation to make. And uh, I wondered, why, why would she ask such a question? Why would she ask such a question? Um, but go back to, to Jesus. Could he be Lord? Can we imagine him as Lord if he were not smart? If he didn't have common sense? If he if he wasn't intelligent or an intellectual? All right. Uh, John begins his gospel by ident identifying Jesus as Logos. Now, what, what does the word Logos mean? The Greek word. And for for the most part, we. Uh, most Bibles will translate that as word. W-O-R-D. But the word logos carries an implication that it is not merely a word, but rather it is uh, an intelligent, rational thought. And when you look at that part of the Greek definition, that absolutely fits Jesus. Intelligent, rational thought. Logos is the root word for our what? about logic. It's the root word for our logic. And Jesus, as this one writer says, as the Logos is the embodiment of logic. I and mean, if you want to see a picture of logic, look at Jesus, if you can find a picture of him. Um, he used this logic all the way throughout his ministry. He used it through his life. And his aim in using this logic it was not to win battles. It was not to win arguments. But rather, his aim was to achieve understanding or insight with his audience. He wanted people to use and to advance their critical thinking skills. <clears throat> How old were you when you first heard that phrase, critical thinking? I was... I was 33 years old. I was in school at Heritage in 2000. 
when one of my literature or my literature professor, Dr. Betty Hammond, talked about critical thinking. What is critical thinking? I had no idea what she was talking about. I thought she wanted me to be critical of her. But I wasn't. Um, but Jesus, this almost sounds too scientific for it, uh, but when you go back and look at all of the interactions he had with people, that's what he's getting toward. He wants people to use and advance their critical thinking skills. Look at the, uh, John chapter 4. I'm not going to take time to read this whole thing. This is a uh, recognize this passage as Jesus meeting the, the woman at the well. And let's see. John chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. This caught her off guard. She wasn't prepared for that because Jews and, and Samaritans have nothing to do with each other. So she, she's caught off guard, and, and she asked, why do you do that? How is it that you ask me, being a Samaritan, to give you a drink? Uh, Jesus answered, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Do you think that's the answer this woman was looking for? No, probably not. And you go down to verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the last thing on that woman's mind. She never thought about this. Well, it's got the wheels to turn in now. And the woman said in verse 15, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Wow. She, ten minutes ago, this was the farthest thing from this lady's mind. She was not interested in what Jesus had to say or, or anything. But to hear that I'll never be thirsty again, yes, I'm interested in that. Well, um, <clears throat> Jesus said to her, verse 16, Go call your husband and come here. Uh, the woman said and answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. All right. Um, verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming <coughs> when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshippers will, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And a woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. All right. Now, he, Jesus has this woman thinking. She's thinking critically right now. And she's trying to relate to the things he said. And she, she admits, we've heard of the Messiah, we've heard of the Christ. When he comes, he's going to teach us these things. Look at Jesus' response. I who speak to you am he. Now, uh, <clears throat> um, how did this meeting with Jesus affect this woman's thinking skills? It, it changed him forever. It changed the way she thought. It changed the way she believed. Um, what did she know after that she did not know before? But one thing is she didn't know that this was the Christ. This was the Messiah. She didn't know that it was possible to never be thirsty again. And what she may or may not have understood, Jesus was speaking spiritually not physically. Um, also, Matthew chapter 14. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 and 13 through 20. When Jesus heard it, he departed there, from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitude heard it, they followed him on, on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, 
They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up into heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitude, so they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. And now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. All right, Jesus does this again with 4,000 people. And then you flip over to chapter 16 and look at verses 5 through 12. This is where this starts to come together. Now when the, chapter 16, verse 5, Now when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it, it is because we've taken no bread. And But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? And how is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? All Jesus wants his disciples to do is use some critical thinking skills. And if they would use those critical thinking skills, they would be able to follow them a lot easier. Now, when we talk about the critical thinking skills, we're not talking about coming to a point of questioning the Scripture. We're not talking about coming to a point of using science to try to disprove the Scripture. That's, that's not it. But think for yourself. Understand what I say, Jesus is telling His disciples. Um, in these two examples, with the woman at the well and feeding the, the 5,000 to 4,000 and how the disciples soon forgot that, um, we get a small taste of how Jesus challenges His disciples to think. We see just a, a, a small fragment of how the mind of Jesus works and how He is always concerned with things of a spiritual nature. Um, he's always trying to lead the minds of his disciples and those who are not disciples to share a like spiritual concern. Now, with that thought in mind, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 13 through 16. Paul says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Well, that's what Jesus was trying to get the woman at the well to do. That's what Jesus was trying to get His disciples to do uh, when, he, when He told them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples thought they were talking about, well, we don't have any bread. It compares spiritual things with spiritual. Uh, verse 14 but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. That is, we are to be concerned with things of a spiritual nature. <clears throat> and in that thought, we can have a better grasp of the intellect of Christ. Uh, when we understand the mind of Christ, then we'll understand better why we should have it. Alright, we'll take, <clears throat> take the rest of the class and look at some examples where we see the intellect of Jesus. I mean, it, it, it's like looking at a picture that it, if, if you misunderstand the, the intellect of, of Jesus in these examples, it's almost like I'm trying to misunderstand them or, or I don't want to understand them. Luke chapter 2, we'll start with that one where Jesus is uh, 12 years old. He's in the temple. Uh, his parents have 
traveled to Jerusalem and through a series of events, they lost him. They don't know where he is. They can't find him. And then, what was it, three days? They, they find him. And what are you doing, Jesus? Can, can you, can you picture his mother telling the 12 year old or asking 12 year old son, where have you been? I remember, uh, I almost got in trouble when I was this old. We, I think we were living in a house up on Walker Lane in uh, Ava Green. And uh, I crawled in the dryer one day, closed the door. <laughs> and when Mama found me, she wasn't happy. Well, she was happy, but she wasn't happy. And then uh, we lived in a little bitty house up in Henderson, Tennessee, several years ago. Alicia was only uh, about two years old. And this house had 500 square feet in it. It was tiny, tiny. Uh, I mean, in our bedroom, we could either have our bed up or we could be able to open and close the door. It was one or the other. So we left the door open and used the bed. Uh, but Alicia, being little, right now she's about 5'1 and 103 pounds soaking wet maybe. So you can imagine what she weighed when she's that old. She uh, can't start looking for one day, couldn't find her. And I started looking for her, couldn't find her. We looked for 15, 20 minutes. This house only got 500 square feet. Look at the house. And we could not find her. And you ever see the movie E.T.? Where E.T. was hiding in the closet with all the toys? Well, she was hiding in the little bitty closet, surrounded with all her stuffed animals. And to look in there, you'd never see her. But her face was right there. Happy we discovered her. We could not find her in that little bitty house. But we did. Um, but Jesus' mother asked him, you know, what are you doing? Why? We've been worried sick about you. We've been worried completely sick about you. Um, <clears throat> from verse 40, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. For 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. Joseph, his mother, and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, uh, they went a day's journey. Okay, one day, not, not three days. And sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. And now so it was that after three days, so it was three days. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teacher, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought for you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must not that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. A um, couple things right there. Uh, number one from verse 47. Jesus is 12 years old, and he's talking with these doctors and, and scribes, all these important people who are to say they're familiar with the old law is an understatement. And he's conducting intelligent conversations with them. Would you listen? Would you take the advice of a 12-year-old on who to vote for? Think about it. Would you take the advice of a 12-year-old who to vote for on who to vote for? I'm thinking, no. Now, they might make sense. And they might agree with everything that I believe, but I'm not going to vote for a certain person because a 12-year-old recommends it. But Jesus, on the other hand, is not your average 12-year-old. Um, and we can tell that he's not the average 12-year-old because of what the way he answered his mother in verse 49. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So when, when I was a kid, and... Uh, I don't really remember the first time I read that verse or heard that verse, but I do remember as a kid thinking, if I told my mama that, she would wear me out. If I told her, don't you know I must be about my father's business? She'll wear me out. 
but this is a whole different situation. We're talking about Jesus revealing, whether it's intentional or unintentional, He's revealing His intellect right now. Alright, uh, look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but... Um, Um, let's see, Mark 7. The scribes and Pharisees here, they, they're worried about the disciples not washing their hands. Now, I'm not worried about, you know, used to be worried about me not washing my hands, and I have to go and wash my hands before we eat. And we do that because of, uh, um, you're not supposed to eat with dirty hands. That's the word I'm trying to think of. Hygiene. That's the word I'm thinking of. We, we wash our hands because of hygiene. We don't want to eat with dirty hands. Um, but that's not the purpose of the the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes here. They want to see the disciples wash their hands because that's what they're supposed to do. That's the tradition that's been passed on forever and ever. The scribes and the Pharisees, they, they are so blind, they are so arrogant um, that they don't understand that it's not the outside of a man that makes him what he is. It's the inside. It's the inside of man. From chapter 7 of Mark, um, verse 9, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit uh, you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift of God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. All right, footnote right here. The Today's equivalent of what Jesus said right there is, if your contribution is big enough on Sunday morning, you don't have to take care of your parents. That's what these scribes and Pharisees believe. Uh, that's what was convenient for them. If you give enough, you don't have to worry about taking care of your parents. Wrong. That's not it. All right. Uh, carrying on from verse 14, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered the house, uh, away from the crowd, the disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all food? And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For uh, from within... Uh, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetous, uh, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things, uh, all these evil things, come from within and defile a man. The <coughs> Pharisees and scribes, they're thinking completely different. They're on a whole different wavelength than what Jesus is teaching here. It's not that you wash your hands in order to keep from becoming defiled, but you need to watch what is in your heart, what comes out of your heart. That's what defiles <laughs> man. And again, this is another good example of Jesus revealing His intellect because he, He's teaching something that is totally foreign to a bunch of scribes and Pharisees that are so blind and so arrogant they don't understand that what defiles a man is what comes out of him. Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. Uh, there is a... Um, the man with a withered hand. And Jesus is going to... <laughs> But the scribes and Pharisees, they're watching him. Why are they watching him? Why are they watching what Jesus does? They're using this as a test. They want to see if he will actually do it and go against the law of Moses and work on the Sabbath day. But Jesus, revealing his knowledge and his intellect, 
uh, and his wisdom and all those things, he asked a very simple question. And again, this, this goes to pointing to the obvious. And like we talked about with Solomon a while, this is pointing to the obvious. Jesus said in verse 4, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? That's like a no-brainer, right? You need to do good. So Jesus went right ahead and healed the man. And again, we see the intellect here. All right, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12, where Jesus heals uh, the paralytic. Uh, the house is so crowded, they have to let the man down through the roof. And uh, Jesus told him, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And how did the Pharisees react to that? Who can forgive sin but God alone? So what did Jesus do in order to prove that he had the power and the authority to forgive sins. What did he do? He healed the man. And what did he tell the man? What did he tell him? Arise, take up your bed, and walk. So, and the way this was explained to me is... <clears throat> Preston, can you bitch press 100 pounds? Me too. <laughs> Me too. All right, let, let's pretend you can bitch press 100 pounds. There's, there's two ways he can prove to us that he can bitch press 100 pounds. One of them is for him to bitch press 100 pounds. What's the other way? And this is going to be one of those, I can't believe you said that, thanks. What's the other way he can prove that he can bitch press 100 pounds? By bench pressing 200 pounds. If you bench press 200 pounds, you got to be able to do 100 pounds. That's what Jesus did here. He proved that he could do the easy by doing what was difficult, or what we would consider difficult. And in, in so doing, he reveals his intellect to us. All right. Now, if you could have watched Jesus work, if you could have watched Jesus work, would your faith be any different today than what it is? And think about that very carefully before you say yes or no. If you could have watched Jesus work, would your faith be any different than what it is today? And let me go ahead and say, I hope you would say no. Hopefully not. The reason I say that comes from uh, John chapter 20. This is one of those statements that just uh, jumps out and absolutely slaps you to get your attention. John 20, um, 30 and 31, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Here we go. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Here, keep in mind, the book of John, the Gospel of John, was written some 60 years after Jesus lived. John saw Jesus. He's an old man now. And he wants his readers, those who were born in the last 60 years who didn't know Jesus, all the way up to 2019, John wants his readers to believe in Jesus as much as he did. So, when I ask you... If you could have seen Jesus work with your physical eyes, would your faith be any different? That's the reason I say, hopefully not. Um, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And you can, you can see Jesus in this passage very quickly. Uh, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Jesus always did that, and in so doing, every time he revealed his intellect. We're done. Right, we're done. I'm not done, but we're done. So, 